going to be showing you another acrylic necklace. And so this one is going to be a fox. The last one I did was a little black cat for Halloween. So this one we have a fox that's all curled up and sleeping and then some autumn leaves. And there is a huge little secret on how I made the color on the autumn leaves. I sculpted them just with a cream color. And then with a little bit of magic, all of a sudden they have that beautiful ombre across them. So if you are curious at all, because this would be very good just for adding an ombre on nails too, definitely make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video to watch how I did that. And I will see you all next time. The first thing I'm going to do is trace the inside line of the bar that I'm using as the base of my fox necklace. This is a hollow tube, little metal tube, that is perfect for starting out these little acrylic necklaces. They're so cute. Um, and I'm going to continue drawing on my piece of paper to make the rest of my template. I'm going to draw my little sleepy fox. I'm going to draw the head and the ears and the backside going around. If you like this type of design, I do have a cat video from a couple weeks ago that is the same um, style, I guess you could say, and is so cute. And if this is your type of thing, I highly recommend that one. So I'll put a link to that in the description box below. After you are happy with your little fox drawing, lay a nail form backing over the top of it you can easily see through the nail form backing to your drawing underneath. If you are finding that it is hard to see your drawing, if you are trying this technique and you're like, you know what, it just seems like it's really difficult to see it. There's a few things that you can do to try to fix that problem. The first thing would be use a darker pen or a more intensely pigmented pen to do your little template drawing. The next thing you can do is some nail form backings are a little bit more opaque than others. So possibly try the backing from a shipping label. Those are super sticky or they're that sticker paper that might work better or possibly a different brand of nail form, which it seems ridiculous to switch your brand of nail form to get a different backing, but maybe that's what you have to do. The ones that I use all the time are the, from Koopa's nail forms and they are very clear and they work really, really well. So I'm going to take with some kind of a warm orange, burnt orange type of a color. I'm going to sculpt the back and the rump of my fox first, and then I'm going to sculpt the paws that the fox is resting her face on. And those are sculpted with black. As I'm sculpting these different pieces, this fox is going to get so many different layers built up on it that it's kind of all about figuring out what is the most important thing to sculpt first. And so you want to think about what is the farthest thing behind, because you don't want to sculpt like her head to start with and then realize, oh no, her head is supposed to be resting on her paws. And then you have to try to sneak those paws underneath. It's a lot easier if you do the things that are the furthest away from you in the beginning and then keep building up layer upon layer to get it higher and higher. As I am adding all of these different layers to my fox, I've now got the face. I am for the most part, with the exception of those paws, for the time being, I'm using just the same color of acrylic. I will go through later and add depth and highlights with a few different shades, but it's good just to get a base down. I love it when I have a nice smooth base of color down and then you can go through and you can add heights and you know color variations and all of that great stuff, but you just have that start. You have a good foundation. So that is what my first, my first goal is. I'm going to add the the biggest area of the tail, the tip of the tail, however, is a completely different color. It is a creamy light shade. So I'm going to do that not with the same burnt orange, but rather with an off-white color. As I'm sculpting that off-white color, you can see the transition from the rest of the tail to that is really rough. But same thing like I was saying, this is the very start. This is the beginning. There is a lot that's going to happen on this and that will get blended out and smoothed out a thousand times over. So don't worry about it currently. I'm going to add more acrylic to the tail, round it off, and just kind of thicken it up and bring some extra bulk. When I'm sculpting a character like this that is going to be used functionally, it's going to be used as a necklace, you don't want to be afraid of having it be too thick. You want to actually build up that height, build up that thickness. And if you are used to sculpting on top of a nail where you want to do 3D stuff, but you want to do it kind of thin so that it's wearable and feels nice to be on a hand, it's a little different because you do need to have that extra thickness so that this sits nicely as a necklace. The other thing that I love with necklaces is when they have a little bit of weight to them, because then as they're wearing, as you have them on, they don't slide around and they don't move so much. They stay where they're supposed to be. And I love it when <laughs> my favorite um, placement to have a necklace is where it's just a little longer than a choker and it sets right on my collarbone. That's my favorite place to have a character necklace because depending on what shirt I'm wearing, it's almost always going to be above the neckline. And I feel like that's a great place to have it showcased. However, when you have a lightweight necklace that is that particular length, then you have the issue of them sometimes sliding and kind of getting caught behind your back. So if you have it where it's a little bit heavier, it really holds its position better. So like I was saying, don't be afraid of this extra weight. 
On my fox, I'm going to be blending in some other colors on the tail to help smooth out that transition transition from the tip of the tail to the base of the tail. I have a darker shade of yellow, not super dark, but just a little bit richer of a color. With a darker red, still kind of in that orangey red tone, I'm going to be adding a lot of shading on my fox. Any place where it's kind of a crease or a separate area, you know, top of the hip, back, kind of in that pit by the belly, bottom of the tail. I'm going to be adding that darker color and then with a darker color yet that's a nice really warm red color. I'm going to be intensifying the shading anywhere I really think it is necessary. With my shimmery yellow color that I used to blend out the tail, I'm going to be adding just a slight little hue of that on certain areas to highlight it, the top of the back, top of the leg, and the top of the tail. I'm not doing any of that shading yet on the face. That'll come in a moment. I just really wanted to start getting that body complete. Once I'm happy with the body, then I'm going to move on to the face. With the same light color that you used for the tip of the tail, I'm going to be adding the sections of the face that are the lighter color. So that's from like tip of the nose, lips, cheek area, up, and then all the way to the points of those cheeks. Depending on the depiction of a cartoon fox that you see, sometimes the eyes are above this lighter section and sometimes they are within it. And usually I would imagine that the reason for that is that the actual, a real fox, the transition isn't this precise. It's a gradual lighter to the orange or the rich red color, if it is a red fox, of course. And so there's no obvious, well, obviously the eye is within it or out of it. So you get to choose, you get to have some fun and you get to pick. I'm going to create a little bit more of a rounded area. So those light sections didn't stick up anymore. They were the same height as the rest of the head. Bring a little more height to the very tip of the nose just to give it a bit more of a 3D edge to it. Keep adding just touches of that color. When you're working with anything like this, even though I said don't be afraid to add height, when you're doing the smaller details like the very tip of the nose and you want to build up height, do it progressively so that all of a sudden you don't have too much and you have to file some away. Even though it is going to take a substantial amount of product and you are going to be building it up, just do it with caution so that you have control. It's always better to work with control and have complete confidence in what you're doing because you're taking your time with it than to try to rush. I'm going to add that shading color, the darker shades of the orangey red and then the rich red to the back of the head and brush them down over the top of the fox's head. If you've never done much shading with acrylic, anytime your sole purpose of your color is to add pigment, which is the case in this shading, you're not really looking to add extra height. It's just really for the color. You want to use really, really wet acrylic. So you're going to dip your brush into your acrylic monomer normally, and then you're just going to tap it into your acrylic powder to pick up the pigment. And then you can brush over it like you're painting. Once you're happy with your fox to this stage, black nose was the last thing I added. Then you're going to hold it against that bar and you're going to use some clear acrylic to secure it. Don't bother trying to use nail glue. Glue won't stick very well to the metal. Just go straight to clear acrylic and hold it in place until you can feel the acrylic really starts to set up and it's not wiggling anymore. And then flip it over, fill in the back of this thing with a lot of acrylic. You wanna have some acrylic that goes all the way up and over the bar bead or the big bar piece so that it's got a full like hug around the bar. That way it really won't go anywhere and you don't have to worry about it breaking off. It's so strong. Um, and then after you have that done where it's really nice and secure, if there's any places on your fox that seem thin, maybe the paws possibly, where they would just be a little more fragile, reinforce those with some more clear acrylic. After he's all set, as far as that goes, then back to your nail form backing, you're going to sculpt the ear. Sculpt one ear at a time let that just begin to turn matte. Once it's matte and you can slide your brush underneath it and pick it up, pick it up and then you're going to place it on the head. If you are wearing a pair of gloves, you may consider using your fingertip to help guide the ear into place. If you are not wearing a pair of gloves, do not do that. You don't want to get any acrylic on your fingers. My ear ended up being a little larger than I wanted to, but because the acrylic was still very pliable, it is super easy to trim it with a manicure scissors. So that's always a good thing to have on hand when you're sculpting something like this and you may have a size discrepancy. Keep a little manicure scissors close by because it'll cut that stuff so simply and it's way easier than trying to fix it a different way later. Repeat the process for the second ear, sculpt on your nail form backing, wait for it to turn matte, pick it up, place it on, on your fox's head, 
make sure that the size is right. Same thing with this one. If this one is also the wrong size, you can go ahead and trim that with your manicure scissors. Hopefully if you do have that issue, you correct it for the second one. I of course don't learn from my mistakes because that would be too easy. And I cut the second ear as well to make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to press those ears down, make sure that they're nice and secure. If there's any places where they stick up or they gap, that's pretty normal. Just fill them in with more of your color of acrylic that you're using for this for the ears, I did start with the same color I've been using all along for everything, that beginning burnt orange color. Blend that out and down. Make a nice seamless transition from forehead to ear. And then you're also gonna to wanna to make sure that especially on the ear that is away from the bar, that you secure it on the back of the head so that there isn't a big gap. So just fill it, fill it in on the back of the head because otherwise that little place, if anything was going to get bumped or hit, it's that ear that is the most at risk for breaking on this particular design. The other ear has the bar to kind of give it some extra protection and then the rest of the fox is super durable. So if you are worried about anything, it's that ear that is sticking straight up. So flip it over, add some clear acrylic to the back of it just to add that extra little bit of peace of mind. Once that's done, I'm going to take my yellow color and I'm going to add a little bit of a highlight on the inside of each ear that really brightens it up and makes it so the ears are extra visible. Do the same thing for the other ear. As you are doing those little bits, that acrylic is the same kind of a thinness as if you were creating that wash of color, acting like it's paint. It's slightly thicker, a little more pigment, and you do have to press it out instead of painting with it, but it is a little thinner than if you were to be sculpting an overlay. With my red color, the deepest color that I was using across my fox, I'm going to apply that to the tips of the ears, really deepen those. Fox are so cute. We have a couple neighborhood foxes that we see occasionally, and they're just so majestic. I'm going to add some black acrylic right along the very edge of each ear. Again, blending it over the red. If you went straight from the burnt orange to black, the transition would not be smooth. Or, I mean, you know, probably. It'd be more difficult to make it smooth. However, if you go orange to red to black, it can look very effortless and very beautiful. With some diluted black paint, I'm going to paint the eyes. I'm making this little foxy a bit stylized. So I'm giving the eyes a nice little, nice little eyeliner style swoosh. With a burgundy color acrylic paint, I'm going to add some outlines around the fox's body, separating the tail from body, body from hip and then adding a few little details here and there. Because I am who I am and detailing is what I do, I'm going to take a brighter shade of orange than I used to start my fox in the beginning, and I'm going to add a little bit of highlighting, little brush strokes here and there across the fox just to give him an extra furry appearance. I love it when any animal art has fur texture to it, whether it's actually sculpted in fur texture or painted on fur texture. I think it just really sells the soft fuzzy feelings that are associated with whatever animal it is that you're looking at. Once you are happy with your fox, set it aside. It does not require top coat as long as it's being used as a necklace. And then you can doodle your leaves if you are adding any leaves. So I'm going to make a maple leaf and an oak leaf. So there's the little drawing for my maple leaf. And then after I have that drawing and I'm happy with it, then you can obviously do your oak leaf as well. Then using the same off-white color acrylic that I used for the tip of my fox's tail, I'm going to be sculpting each of these leaves. So I'm going to just begin. This is where the surprise comes in, you guys. The surprise is almost here. This little technique that I used to tint the leaves, I was super happy with how it turned out. So I'm going to continue working on this little oak leaf. The oak leaf has three prongs at the top and then three sections of two bumps, if that makes sense. Whereas the maple leaf is a lot more pointed, the oak leaf is a lot, lot softer and it's longer and thinner. If you have any questions about leaves and autumn leaves and what's around, if you Google autumn leaves, you will find so many different charts and images and the inspiration is really endless. Or if you want to take a more naturalist approach, you can walk outside your door and if you're in a climate that currently has fallen leaves, you should be able to find them aplenty. I know I certainly can. My whole backyard is filled in with leaves right now. So we have, we have plenty of inspiration at our fingertips. I'm going to sculpt, like I said, first the oak leaf and then the maple leaf. I'm going to make two of each of these. So after I have my first set sculpted, I'm going to slide my nail form backing over and use my template again to replicate the process. If these leaves seem like they're very, very thin, you may want to add a second coat or a little bit of reinforcement acrylic to them. They will get a little thicker once we add the pieces that attach them to the necklace. However, you don't want them to break before you get to that point. So it's a you know, just be careful with them because they are, that this shape lends itself to being a little bit more fragile. 
going to just round out those sections between the five different areas of the maple leaf, carry down the stem. And then I'm going to twist some very fine, very, very fine jewelry wire into a little loopy shape on one end. And then I'm going to line it up against my leaf and see where it comes out on the other side so that I can make another little loopy shape on the other side. I'm using a cone shaped wire tools to help with that or a rounded wire tool really makes this process so much easier than if you don't have that particular type of a tool, pinch the ends of those wire in so they don't stick out. And then I'm going to lay this across the back of my first leaf. You have to repeat the process for all four leaves. If it's the right size, then you're going to grab some clear acrylic, set that on the back of your little leaf, place your wire piece into that clear acrylic, and then go up over the wire and then across the entire back of your leaf. As you're doing this, make sure that you really cover up the ends of the wire so that they aren't sharp. Even if you're using jewelry wire, if those ends are sticking out, they are pokey. So make sure that they are completely covered up so that you don't end up stabbing yourself or whoever is going to end up wearing this necklace. Add plenty of clear acrylic to the back of these leaves. As I said, if anything is going to be fragile or break on this design, if you're making the entire thing, then it is definitely going to be these leaves and the thin little skinny leaf sections that come out. So just make sure that you cover those up so that there's, there's no risk. As long as you have a nice layer of clear acrylic across the back of the leaves, I don't really think there's any, any risk because it's about the thickness of an acrylic nail and those rarely break. It's just, if you're, you know, not, not being that careful. After the leaf is completely secured, I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to apply a coat of a foil gel. This is a product that after it's cured, remains sticky so that it grips foil. Cure that and then grab an eyeshadow palette that has a bunch of these autumn colors that you do not use on your eyes anymore. And with a fluffy brush that you also do not use on your eyes anymore, start burnishing those eyeshadows into the surface of that foil gel. The foil gel will pick up on the color. It'll create very soft ombres. If you want more intense color, I would recommend using a gel base coat that cures with an inhibition layer, which is a different type of sticky. And if you do that, the colors will get a little bit more intense. However, it will gum up your eyeshadow brush and you will have to probably wipe it out if it does start to get really, really sticky. Whereas the foil gel leaves no residue at all on your eyeshadow brush and the colors are just so soft and lovely. I love the way that this turned out. I'm really happy with the results. And so I thought I would share this little technique with you guys. I thought it was the coolest thing and I, it would make really beautiful ombres on clients too, or just on your own nails. You could use the same technique with some, um, gel, some gel paint. I'm going to add the veining on the leaves and apply some matte top coat over the top of it. Do the same thing for your oak leaf. This time I'm going to use yellow and green instead of the oranges and the reds and the yellows. And then with brown, add the veining on the oak leaf as well. Same thing. Look at some photos so that you have the whole leaf shape as accurate as you can, as well as the veining. Every type of leaf is going to have a slightly different characteristics with all of those things. So try to get as close as you can. With a thicker jewelry gel than I use for the leaves, I'm going to create a little loop-de-loop -loop on the one end, slide it through the bar of my fox, and then I'm going to wind up the loop-de-loop -loop on the other side, kind of pinch those together so that they're nice and flat, and then string a little jump ring through that loop-de-loop, -loop. string your first leaf through the loop, and then you're going to continue. So add another jump ring, your next leaf, close the ring, Repeat the process for the other side of your fox necklace so that you have two leaves on either side of the fox. And then once they're all closed, this is one of those things where it's like the tedious part that I'm just like, oh, I want to get done with it because I'm so close. This is that moment where I'm just like, get in there, go where you're supposed to go. On the end of the last leaf, you're going to attach the chain. So with another jump ring, just attach the chain and then loop your chain around and attach it to the other side, making a closed circle. Make sure that the necklace is measured to the size that you want it to be in the finished product. After it's been completely closed, obviously it's too tight to get over your head. So pinch, hold the fox and then pinch the end. So you get the middle of the chain and then take your jewelry tool and you're going to cut the wire of the chain attach a lobster clip to one side and just a simple jump ring to the other side. And that is the end of it. That's the whole necklace. This last part is really quick. It's probably a 10 minute process to get this all assembled, but it's just one of those things where it's like, you're so close. You can taste the end 
And it's such a sense of relief when it is done and it is finished. And you can put this necklace on. I love it. I hope you guys like this as much as I do. I am so excited about all these necklaces. If you want one made that's custom or like one of them that I have, certainly reach out to me. I would love to make one for you. And I will see you all next time. Bye.